Hello and welcome to week 5 and lesson 2 of the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In this week, as we continue with the classes on uh, microeconomics of education, uh, we will focus on a very basic model of human capital investment. In the last class, we have uh, begun understanding the concept of human capital and in this class, we will introduce the concept of uh, the basic model of human uh, capital uh, in a more formal manner. Now, let me uh, inform the learners that before the 1940s and 50s, education was mostly a peripheral issue when it came to issues of economic development or theorizing issues of economic growth and this is particularly in terms of the labor market. Now, most economists from the uh, pre-Second World War period regarded the benefits of uh, education as being concentrated at the political uh, or moral level rather than at an economic level. However, uh, during the period of 1940s, a few American economists started talking about education as an instrument of economic policy and it is uh, since uh, then that uh, education as an investment started taking mainstream uh, theoretical positions in economics and the economics of education started coming up as a discipline in itself. Now, in the last class, we discussed two important uh, topics based on a, a general reading format. We got introduced to uh, a researched paper by uh, Mark Roser and uh, this uh, paper uh, where we saw that in the modern times, uh, while schooling and school enrollments have increased, uh, it uh, has not necessarily shown up in the form of uh, learning outcomes. Now, this is particularly important at the uh, primary levels of schooling where we saw that children who have completed uh, primary schooling levels may not have had uh, proportionate uh, increases in uh, uh, proportionate outcomes in the form of uh, learnings. Now, we also discussed uh, the that along with increase in quantity of education, there should be equal emphasis on uh, quality of education and based upon Mark Roser's paper, we also saw that, um, that simple uh, improvements in educational pedagogy or improvements in uh, teaching syllabuses at the right level can uh, see an increase in the overall impact of quality of education rather than initiating major investments in education technology and so on. Now, with this primer, we got introduced to the topic of demand for education uh, within the field of economics of education and uh, we also saw how the discipline of economics has tried to theorize the concept of demand for education. We got introduced to uh, two uh, specific uh, concepts. One is education as uh, enhancement of minimum capabilities. We drew from uh, Amartya Sen's understanding uh, theories of capability approach and we saw that often education is demanded as enhancement of minimum creative capabilities. Uh, for example, being able to read instructions on an electrical appliance or being able to read information on books and so on and so forth. Now, um, the other uh, part is that we saw that education can be demanded as a form of human capital investment and this is where we started drawing on the concept of education as long term investment and there is a lot of discussion, there is a lot of theorization surrounding the concept of education as investment. There are a lot of influential thinkers who have also contributed to this field of uh, uh, to this field of education as human capital investment. Now, to be able to view the investment nature of education, we need to understand the demand for education because of uh, people's participation in labor markets. And this will be the beginning point of today's lesson, where we uh, will understand a basic model of human capital uh, investment, primarily because all rational human beings make a choice of participating in the labor market. So, let us begin. Now, labor market investments in simple uh, terms, it refers to employment uh, choices or the kinds of choices that workers make to be able to participate in various employment conditions. So, many labor supply choices entail a substantial in initial investment by a worker. Now, these initial investments, education is one of the most basic investments that a person who wants to be available in the labor market makes. So, by definition, we know that investments refer to an initial cost borne by the worker, which he or she hopes to recover over some period of time. 
And for many labor supply decisions, current wages and working conditions are therefore not the only deciding factors, but the uh, kind of education one has had can also be one of the deciding factors with regard to labor supply decisions. So, labor supply decisions therefore have to be understood using a framework of investment behavior of workers with a lifetime uh, perspective. Note that I have uh, bolded some of the words here, for example, investments by a worker, labor supply decisions, uh, wages, working conditions, investment behavior, lifetime perspective. I have bolded these words because these are concepts and terms within the uh, scope of uh, education economics, which has a far reaching implication implications when it comes to modeling a theory of uh, modeling a human capital investment behavior. So, it is in that sense that I have bolded these terms and for an interested learner who is interested to uh, study more and more uh, research material surrounding these topics which I will discuss in this class also, it will be useful uh, for the interested learner. Okay, so, there are generally three types of human capital investments that we talk about when a worker is making a choice of participation in the labor market. So, one is education and training, second is migration, it could be internal migration, uh, migrating within a country uh, in search of jobs or migrating outside of uh, the state or a country or your location of habitation for uh, looking for work. And the third is search for new jobs and search for new jobs also means that you have the information that is required to be able to search for new jobs. So, these are the three major types of investments that are made by a worker to be able to be part of the labor market. Now, all of these uh, above involve an initial cost that has to be made in the hope that investments will pay off in the future. You may recall from the last class that we have understood human capital as a term that conceptualizes workers as embodying skills that can be rented out to employees and this is how we differentiated between human capital and physical capital. So, knowledge and skills coming from education and training give rise to a certain stock of productive human capital and the value of this productive capital is derived from how much these skills can earn in the labor market. For example, job search and migration are activities that increase the value of human capital by increasing the price or the wage received for a given stock of uh, skills. So, the important points to be noted here is that we are talking about a stock of productive human capital. This is exactly on similar lines that we talked about health as a durable capital stock. Uh, where we uh, understood that a healthy individual or an individual who has had uh, many investments made on ensuring that he or she maintains good health is also considered as enhanced human capital, which is a form of investment, which means that a healthy individual will be able to put in more productive time in the labor market. On similar lines, we are also talking about uh, education or a skillful human being as a stock of productive human capital and the value of this productive capital is derived from how much these skills can earn in the labor market. So, while we are talking about uh, stock of productive human capital, we are also putting a valuation on this productive human capital by talking about what are the levels of earnings of this productive human capital in the labor market. And the levels of earnings will be decided based upon the kind of information let us say one has about the labor market, the amount of education and training one has put in uh, to be able to have that stock of productive human capital, whether or not one is migrating uh, from one place to the other in search of better opportunities, all of these taken together influence the wage rate or the price of the productive human capital that is participating in the labor market. Now, the other important point is that while we are looking at these kinds of investments that a worker is making in the labor market, these investments are made keeping in mind a life cycle perspective. So, it is not that these investments are made only in the beginning of the lifespan approach that is being taken. There may be small increments over a period of time taking a life cycle perspective. So, there are broadly three stages of investments in knowledge and skills that is considered uh, within the scope of education economics beginning with 
childhood where there is acquisition of human capital but it is determined by the decisions of others mostly parents uh, for example primary schooling secondary schooling higher secondary schooling and so on where parents play a very important role of motivating children to be able to acquire the basic creative capabilities that is required to achieve uh, further human capital so parental resources and guidance the cultural environment within which a child grows now uh, early schooling experiences uh, they all influence the basic language and mathematical skills learning attitudes as well as impacts the general health and life expectancy of a a uh, rational individual or a human being so childhood is one of the first stages of investment in knowledge and skills second is uh, teenagers and young adults where uh, we acquire knowledge and skills as full time students in high schools and colleges or vocational training programs and this is an important period of uh, decision making with respect to uh, education as an investment because this is the period where we have the uh, we we forego various kinds of earnings in anticipation of earning or having future expected returns from education and finally after entering the labor market where workers add to their human capital by on job training night schools continuous learnings through online courses formal training programs etc so there are these three stages childhood young adulthood and after entering the labor market where there are various kinds of investments that are continuing to be able to put a final value on the or or, or to be able to uh, have a value of the productive stock of human capital or stock of productive human capital now let us also understand uh, that there are broadly three categories of costs of acquiring human capital so far we have studied about the stages of investments in knowledge and skills we have looked at the different types of human capital investments but let us also understand what are the costs of acquiring human capital because often in economics we are trying to balance the costs with benefits or what are the returns that we are expecting out of the costs that we are incurring in the current period so broadly there are three categories of costs of acquiring the human capital that we are uh, in pursuit of first is out of pocket or direct expenses on uh, the acquiring of human capital so this basically refers to all the direct expenditures that we are making on acquiring of uh, the uh, education or different forms of training or uh, migration that we are carrying out so these are all out of pocket expenses uh, it may refer to tuition costs expenditures on books and transportation other supplies uh, fees etc so if we are moving from one place to the other Uh, so we might have to pay a price for the information that we want to have for uh, what kind of uh, employment opportunities uh, commensurate to the skills and training that we have is available or not so those can also be added as direct costs of um, of acquiring uh, human capital so out of pocket expenditures in fact forms one of the most important uh, costs in the cost categories that directly impacts the uh, the demand for uh, education or demand for human skill um, or human capital acquiring second is foregone earnings as i just mentioned that during the period of young adulthood when uh, many of us are in schools and colleges it is also a period where we are uh, foregoing earnings Uh, while we are already in the uh, working age group we are foregoing earnings because in in anticipation of uh, having better earnings in future if we uh, invest the current period in uh, education so foregone earnings arises because during the investment period it is usually impossible to work full time um some people take up part time uh, jobs uh, during this period to tide over the uh, costs that they are incurring on current period but this uh, forms another important the opportunity cost that we are foregoing because of not being in the labor market is an important uh, cost category the third category is what is referred to as psychic losses now this is often difficult to understand in the context of uh, education but uh, or in the context of acquiring of human skills uh, or uh, human capital now this often refers to those kinds of losses 
or negative feelings that we have because learning is often tedious and difficult and not necessarily pleasurable. So, in that sense, we are foregoing a lot of uh, pleasurable time by not carrying out activities uh, that uh, may have given us perhaps more pleasure, but in a sense we are foregoing pleasure because we are anticipating better returns in future if we go through tedious processes of learning in the current period and there can be a cost imputed on these kinds of uh, utilities as well, uh, which may be uh, non-economic, but it gives us uh, some amount of utility or pleasure in a current period of time. For example, if I have a hobby of uh, pursuing uh, music or uh, drama or uh, something else on these lines and if I am anticipating uh, better earnings based upon the kind of investments I am making on my education today and I am foregoing those pleasures to be able to uh, go through the tedious process of learning today, then I am incurring some kind of psychic losses and there can be uh, a cost imputed on these uh, losses as well. So, there are these three uh, categories of costs of acquiring human capital. So, we can have out of pocket or direct expenditures, there are foregone earnings and there are uh, psychic losses also. Now, usually the expected returns are in the form of higher future earnings, increased job satisfaction or appreciation of non-market activities. But often quantifying all of these future benefits is not easy or straightforward because there is a substantial delay involved in receiving these investment returns. So, while we are investing on human capital formation and uh, by the time we participate in uh, labor market, there is a substantial time delay and therefore, to be able to put uh, a value on all of these costs is often not very uh, straightforward, but when we are making a choice uh, to be in the labor market in future, often there is a cost calculation and a returns calculation that goes on in the minds of rational human beings. Now, this brings us to the concept of uh, present value. Let, let me just take a minute to summarize some of the important points that we have studied so far. What we began with labor market investments, we uh, saw that uh, investments in human capital uh, can be uh, understood from the point of view of our participation in the labor market and labor market choices or labor supply choices refers to initial investments that we are making. So, there are labor supply decisions and these labor supply decisions are not necessarily based upon only current wages and work conditions, but it is based upon the investment behavior of workers. So, we are considering a framework of investment behavior with a lifetime perspective. Now, we also saw that there are three types of human capital investments that we are talking about. One is education and training. So, while we are talking about economics of education, we are not necessarily talking only about education and training, but we are also talking about all the other associated costs. For example, moving from one place to the other in search of jobs, uh, which includes migration, the search for new jobs uh, for based upon the information that we have. These are all a part of the uh, economics of education uh, um, scope of uh, study. And we have also seen that knowledge and skills coming from education and training generally give rise to a certain stock of productive human capital and we are valuing this productive capital in the market based upon their skills and how much their skills can earn in the labor market. And we have also seen that job search and migration, all of these contribute to the value of human capital by influencing the price or the wage at which the productive human capital is hired within the market. We have also seen that there are three stages of investments when it comes to knowledge and skills, the childhood period, young adulthood and after entering the labor market. So, basically we are considering a life cycle perspective when we are looking at human capital investment, which means that when we are looking at costs and returns, we have to keep in mind that the, it is a life cycle approach that is to be kept in mind when we are uh, uh, looking at the returns to education. Returns to education need not only be uh, calculated based upon 5 years or 6 years of productive time spent on college education, but returns to education needs to be calculated over a period of time, which means experience that one gains uh, in the job market or the add-on trainings that one receives in the job market can also add on to the, uh, can also influence the returns to um, the uh, education and training in the labor market and so on. 
Broadly, there are three categories of costs that we have just discussed, out-of-pocket expenses, opportunity cost of foregone earnings and the psychic losses. So that brings us to the concept of uh, present value. Now why it is important for us to understand this concept of present value? This is because when we are committing to an investment decision, an investor or a person who is investing in let us say education comment, uh, commits to the current expenses or the expenditure in return for some expected future benefit. So for example, if I am spending today on my engineering education or my medical education, I am expecting some returns, uh, expected, there are expected future benefits, but I must also be concerned about what will be the present value of the expected future benefits and that is what helps me to take an investment decision of whether I should pursue engineering education given my cost conditions given that I am faced with or I should pursue a nursing education given the cost conditions I am faced with or I should pursue a general education if I am uh, given the cost conditions that I am faced with. Therefore, the concept of present value of expected future benefits is of paramount importance when it comes to human capital investment model. All investment returns have an element of risk and this is because it is delayed. So there is a time period uh, within which the skill that you have acquired may not be used in the labor market. It could be because uh, you are pursuing the education and therefore you are not available for the labor market or it could be because uh, you have already pursued the kind of education that you required, you have already acquired the skills that you require to be in the labor market, but for some reason you have not been hired into the labor market. It could be because of general economic conditions or it could be because of some frictional unemployment within the economy. So there can be a host of reasons as to why uh, the your transition from uh, education to labor market is delayed and the delay gives rise to an element of risk. So often investors have to compare the current value of expenditure or the current value of investment outlays that we are making with the current value of expected returns after taking into account the effects of delays in returns. Now let us try and understand this with the help of a simple example. Suppose an individual is offered rupees 100 now or rupees 100 in one year's time, would they be equally attracted to both the alternatives? Now obviously no because if they receive the money now they can spend or invest and earn an interest. So let us say the interest rate were 5 percent which means rupees 100 in this year can grow into rupees 105 next year. So if rupees 100 received now is worth more than receiving rupees 100 next year. Now with an interest rate of 5 percent it would take an offer of rupees 105 to be received in a year to match the value of getting rupees 100 now. What does this mean? This means that receiving rupees 100 now or rupees 105 next year would be an equivalent value which would be an attractive offer for the individual rather than the individual being offered uh, a choice of getting rupees 100 now or rupees 100 in one year. Now what does it translate to? Let us say that in the in time period 0 which is or call it year B0 the uh, individual gets an amount of rupees 100. We begin with this. Uh, so this is basically the amount of investment let us say that the individual is making on um, uh, acquiring human capital. Now the expected value in year 1 or time period 1 B1 is rupees 105 at the rate of 5 percent uh, rate of interest. So basically the, uh, the expected the present expected value of uh, 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 B1 is B0 which is the principal amount 100 plus the uh, B0 multiplied by the rate, rate of interest which comes to B0 into 1 plus R or 105 rupees. Now we can also say that the present value of expected returns, the present value of expected returns uh, can be written as B1 upon 1 plus R. Now similarly if the return is 2 years away we can have a sum B2 where B2 is B1 plus B1 into R and substituting uh, B0 in this equation we get B2 is equal to B0 into 1 plus R plus B0 into 1 plus R multiplied by R which is B0 into 1 plus R whole square. In other words, to find the present value of a benefit to be received in 2 years we discount the future benefit by 1 plus R whole square. Now, 
if we sum up the present value of expected returns for the entire lifespan, let us say we have a lifespan of t years. So, if a human capital investment yields returns of b1 in first year, b2 in second year and so forth for t years, then the sum of these benefits has a present value that is calculated as follows, where the present value is the it is basically the discounted present value of the amount of investment that we are making within the time period t and uh, here r is the interest rate or the discount rate and as long as r is positive or the discount rate is positive, benefits in the future will be progressively discounted. So, while we are making an expenditure in the current period, uh, the present value of the uh, expected future benefits has more importance to us than just the amount that we are um, investing in the current period. Now, um, let me take you back again to this concept of uh, uh, present value. Here, I am trying to convey the point that when committing to an investment decision, an investor commits to a current outlay of expenditure in return for expected future benefits. There is a risk involved because of the time delay in the current expenditure and the by the time we earn start uh, earning benefits out of the current expenditure. So, as an investor who is investing in my education, I have to compare the current value of investment outlay with the current value of expected returns and this is done by the method of discounting based upon the discount rate or the rate of interest. Uh, that is applicable to the amount that we are uh, spending today. So, let us say the amount that we are spending today on education is x and if we could commit that amount to a bank rate of interest and at some percentage, then what is the amount that I would be uh, that would be accruing to my investment over a period of time, I should rather be concerned about the discounted value of the expected benefits than just the present value of the expenditure that I am making in the current period. So, based upon this, we uh, come up with the present value calculation for the entire lifespan where over a period of time, we will be concerned about what is the rate of interest or what is the discount rate and that will help us to come up with the present value of the expected future benefits over the period of the lifespan that we are making small, small investments on human capital. Now, we need to model the human capital investment decision. And here we uh, follow uh, the standard assumptions of uh, economics where we know that people are generally utility maximizers and they take a lifetime perspective when making a decision about training and education. So, we are comparing the uh, investment costs with the present discounted value of expected future benefits. Uh, say when we when taking a decision about additional schooling or higher education or you are already in the labor market and you want to go back to the education and take a back seat uh, from the labor market. So, when we are making these kinds of uh, decisions, we are often comparing our near term investment costs with the present discounted value of expected future benefits. So, investment in additional schooling will be attractive for the utility maximizing individual here if the present future benefits exceeds the costs that we are incurring on our investments in the current period. So, the present value uh, greater than c is the, is the condition that the utility maximizing individual is presented with for making an investment decision. Now, very simplistically speaking, we can model this, uh, we can diagrammatically show the investment decision as follows. In uh, figure A, uh, both the figures on the y axis show marginal costs and marginal benefits following the standard economics uh, models. On the x axis, we have units of human capital. You can also interpret it as saying uh, units of education demanded uh, over a period of time. There is no mention about the short run or the long run in this figure here. Now, let us look at uh, the uh, figure A first. So, uh, here we have assumed marginal costs of each additional unit of human capital as constant, which basically includes all those costs that we are incurring because uh, in the form of out of pocket expenditures or opportunity cost and psychic losses, etc. So, here let us say we begin with uh, this level of marginal cost and a standard marginal benefit curve is presented to us in this uh, model. So, the point of intersection of marginal benefit and marginal cost curve is the point of uh, is the optimal decision making point for the individual and you would see that if uh, at this point when the marginal benefit cost and marginal uh, 
cost curve are uh, intersecting with each other. We are demanding HC star units of human capital. But for some reason, if the marginal cost curve goes up, then the units of human capital that is being demanded also comes down. So, which means that costs have an important consideration with regard to uh, demand uh, for units of human capital. Now, in this figure, we have shown again a marginal uh, constant marginal cost curve and we begin with uh, this uh, marginal uh, benefit curve, the first marginal benefit curve where we are demanding HC star units of human capital. But for some reason, let us say if uh, we do not expect our expected future, the present value of expected future benefits uh, comes down, then our uh, demand for human capital units also comes down. Uh, similarly, uh, the other way, if we begin with let us say HC double prime this point here and we are demanding HC units of human capital, but for some reason we expect our uh, present value of expected future benefits to go up, which means that the marginal benefit curve shifts outwards, then our uh, the units of human capital that we are uh, demanding increases. So, uh, this is basically you know a very basic model of human capital investment where we are saying that the present value of expected future benefits compared with costs helps us to decide what are the units of human capital that can be demanded in a given period of time. Uh, this is something similar to what we had done in the last class about the marginal returns from uh, education and uh, the quantity of education that we are demanding in the short run. Uh, so, this uh, basically gives us an idea about uh, how taking the construct of human capital formation we theorize about demand for education. Let me uh, now again uh, go back and summarize this first part of the lesson which we have just ended where we got introduced to the idea of a basic human capital uh, model. Uh, the basic human capital uh, model has to be understood in the context of labor market because education has a direct relationship with labor market participation. We uh, invest in education, we invest in training because we want a smooth transition from um, education to labor market. Therefore, when we are referring to investments in education, it has to be considered in the context of labor market conditions. So, we uh, looked at the um, investments by a worker that is made uh, keeping in mind the labor supply decisions. We saw that labor supply decisions are not necessarily a function of current wages and working conditions, but also of uh, the amount that is spent and the investment decision that is being made on education. So, we have taken a framework of investment behavior of workers with a lifetime perspective. We considered three types of human capital. We brought in the concept of stock of productive human capital. We saw that the value of this productive capital is derived from how much these skills can earn in the labor market. And we saw that the price or the wage is also determined based upon the earnings uh, that the productive human capital has in the labor market. Three stages of investments in knowledge and skills using a life cycle perspective. Three categories of costs of acquiring human capital, out of pocket expenditures, a very important uh, uh, component of total expenditures, opportunity cost of foregone earnings and psychic losses that needs to be imputed into the total costs. However, it is not very straightforward because there is a, a risk amount involved, there are substantial delays between uh, incurring of costs and the present value of the expected returns from the uh, labor market. That brought us to the concept of uh, present value. As I said, there is an element of risk involved when we talk about the concept of present value because of the time lag. We saw this in the with the help of an example, the discounted rate or the rate of interest uh, within the economy with respect to the kind of investments that we are making in the short run and what it can earn if we are uh, if, if it is put to some other use in the long run has a very important role to play with respect to the amount of costs that we want to incur on human capital formation in the present period. So, we came up with the uh, uh, present uh, value uh, formula which is basically the discounted value in the current period based upon the lifetime of earnings that we have over a period of time t. And then we model the human capital investment decision by comparing the investment costs with the present discounted value. Uh, for a utility maximizing individual, if the present value of future benefits exceeds costs, then it is an attractive offer to be able to continue to invest in the current period on education and training and so on. 
and then we showed a simple diagrammatic representation of how to see the uh, fluctuations uh, with respect to human capital acquisition. Uh, so, it is based upon the simple uh, intersection of marginal cost and marginal benefit curves following the standard um, assumptions of neoclassical economics. Uh, we have already understood marginal cost curves and marginal benefit curves in the past lessons. Now, let us move to the second part of this lesson where I make an attempt to introduce to some of the influential thinkers in the field of human capital theory. Now, much of the theorization that we see uh, with respect to the time uh, delay uh, or the conceptualization of investment, looking at education as investment or a durable productive capital stock or much of the discussion surrounding uh, foregone costs, opportunity costs, uh, psychic losses, etc., which we have theorized now draws from the various uh, extensive studies that have been carried out by many influential thinkers over the period of last uh, 70 uh, or 80 years. And it is important that we uh, take a few names, we get to know uh, a few economists who have made uh, substantial contributions in this field. Let me begin with uh, uh, Professor Theodore Schulz, um, who lived between 1902 and 1998. He was an American agricultural economist and one of the principal articulators of the human capital concept. Much of uh, what I have mentioned in this uh, lesson about uh, Schulze's work is taken from the uh, History of Economic Thought website. I would also uh, recommend the students, the learners to visit the History of Economic Thought website, which has very uh, nicely uh, profiled various economists from different schools of thought and uh, an interested learner can take uh, many uh, examples and many uh, resources uh, from this website. So, some of the major works on human capital theory that Schulz has worked on range from the 1950s till the 1980s. For example, Human Wealth and Economic Growth, uh, the pioneering paper on investment in human capital which appeared in the American Economic Review, Investment in Human Capital, the Role of Education and uh, Research, then Investing in People, the Economics of Population Quality. Uh, he was a Chicago school economist and uh, he's also worked on the economics of family, marriage, children and human capital. Now, it is important to point out these works because for a long time, uh, studies surrounding economics of health and education were not considered a part of uh, economics uh, per se, but uh, these economists are credited with using the neoclassical construct to be able to theorize about so-called non-economic behavior such as uh, family, marriage, children and so on. Now, I have drawn some uh, summary uh, statements from uh, his work on investment in human capital which appeared in 1961. Uh, for the benefit of the learners, I want to uh, indicate some of the important conclusions that we have drawn from Schulze's work. There are many more, uh, but uh, some of these points are worth paying attention. So, first is this concept of human capital as investment. Schulz uh, argues that skills and knowledge acquired by individuals should be considered as a form of capital, which uh, imagine in the 1940s and 50s, it was still not mainstream to consider skills and knowledge as capital. Uh, so, it is during these times that uh, economists such as Schulz argued that skills and knowledge must be considered as a form of capital and this capital is largely the product of deliberate investment much like physical capital. So, uh, so the, the kind of uh, investment decision that a worker is taking, a potential worker is taking uh, of being in education in the current period is an investment in itself and it has grown much faster in western societies than conventional capital is one of the conclusions that he derived in his work on investment in human capital. He was also one of the first persons to uh, connect uh, increase in human capital to economic growth. So, increase in human capital is a primary factor in the significant rise in national output and it cannot be solely uh, attributed to increases in land or work hours or physical reproducible capital. And Schulz contended that investments in human capital explain much of the rise in real earnings uh, per worker. And this is a very important area of work within the field of labor economics, education economics economics and health economics. Uh, all of these uh, str strains of economics are studied together 
and uh, there is a lot extensive work in the area of rise in real earnings per worker and the role of education and health or human capital in it. Types of investment is another area that he uh, focused on, identified various forms of human capital investment including expenditures on education, health, internal migration for better job opportunities. He included less obvious investments such as income forego on which we just discussed by mature students attending school and by workers undergoing on the job training. So, these all became a part of theorization of education economics because of works by uh, economists like Schulz. Under investment and policy implications, uh, this is one of the conclusions based upon his work where he discussed why economists have traditionally avoided treating human beings as capital. This is mostly because and this was often due to moral and philosophical concerns. He argued that this avoidance has led to an under investment in human capital. So, this uh, I found to be very important because unless you give primacy to a certain uh, component of uh, human capital as investment, it cannot be mainstreamed in policy uh, decisions or policy making. And it is in this sense that it is important, uh, this contention by economists such as Schulz was important, where uh, traditionally it was talking about education was avoided because it was considered to have only moral or philosophical uh, connotations or implications. But he argued that it is important to mainstream uh, the concept of education and not restrict it to peripheral discussion because investment in human capital is in important, investments in schooling is important, colleges is important, investments in providing training and skills to human uh, beings are important. So, he suggested several policy changes including tax reforms and promotion of long term loans for education to address this under investment. Returns on an investment is another important area that Schulz worked on. He provided evidence that investments in uh, human capital yield significant returns both uh, for the individual and for the society as a whole uh, contributing to overall economic growth. He uh, noted that rapid increases in stock of education among labor force can substantially give uh, increase national incomes. So, there is a direct correlation between increased human capital or productive labor force within the economy and its contribution to economic growth which started gaining a lot of uh, uh, importance uh, in the context of growth models as well as development models in particular reference to the developing countries. Uh, he uh, mentioned the role of human capital in developing countries where the emphasis was on giving importance to investment in human capital and he uh, was critical uh, about the tendency to focus solely on physical capital and argued that neglecting human capital will limit the potential for economic uh, development. And there was a call for comprehensive economic analysis where he argued that uh, excluding human capital from economic studies leaves many puzzles about economic growth unresolved. So, in this sense, Schulz's intellectual contribution to the economics of education has been uh, profound. He received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 1979, shared with Professor Arthur Lewis, and he received this prize for his research on economic development of agriculture and his contributions to understanding of how human capital, particularly education, skills and health affects economic growth and uh, development. His work also highlighted the importance of investing in human capital as a means to enhance productivity and economic outcomes. So, this is about uh, Theodore Schulz, who was one of the earlier thinkers of human capital uh, that contributed to the field of economics of education. The second important name is that of Gary S. Becker. Now, while I am taking the names of these economists, that is not to say that there are not many more economists who have contributed to the study of human capital growth models and so on, but it is important for uh, a basic course on economics of education to go back to some of these influential thinkers who have extensively worked in this area. So, Gary Becker uh, was also a Nobel Prize winner and uh, he lived between 1930 and 2014 and his works range across uh, topics of human capital formation and it is not just limited to um, uh, education and training or skills acquiring in the labor market. He's worked on economics of discrimination, uh, the theory of allocation of time, economic approach to uh, human behavior, human capital effort and sexual division of labor. He has also done a lot of work on family and uh, crime and so on and so forth. 
again i have taken from his work on investment in human capital a theoretical analysis which appeared in 1962 let us look at some of his important contributions this is uh, not exhaustive but certainly some selective uh, important contributions to the theory of human capital so becker expanded the notion that investments in education and training are similar to investments in physical capital which we have discussed in the last class and uh, he said that it enhances future productivity and earnings and he also emphasized that education on job training and health improvements are critical for human capital investment he also contributed to the concept of economic returns on education where he developed a theoretical framework to estimate the monetary returns of education at different levels so if one has only high school education or one has also college education how that impacts the economic returns on education and he demonstrated that investments in education yield significant returns not just for individuals but also for the economy at large and this is something which has uh, this idea of education contributing to not just individual growth but also the economy and society at large has grown in leaps and bounds and therefore we are considered to be a knowledge economy uh, where knowledge drives economic growth the correlation between age and earnings profiles is another important contribution of gary becker where he analyzed how earnings typically increase with age at a decreasing rate highlighting that the rate of increase and in the level of skill are positively uh, correlated he showed that individuals who invest in higher levels of education and training tend to have higher earnings over their lifetimes but this is at a diminishing rate uh, unemployment and skill levels he has showed that unemployment rates are generally inversely related to skill levels meaning that higher skilled workers experience lower unemployment rates and therefore in doing so he emphasized the importance of investing in human capital to reduce unemployment and all of these theories also need to be uh, studied in the current context by learners where for example in india we have experienced very high levels of education uh, but the transition from the education to labor market has not been happening uh, which is in contrast to the theorization of the influential thinkers like gary becker and schulz uh, which concluded that uh, probably investments in higher education can lead to better employment opportunities while some of these transitions have been noticed in the context of the developed countries but in the context of developing countries uh, we still see very high levels of unemployment and underemployment and these issues have been posed as conundrums and are being studied currently by many scholars across the world Becker also makes a point about specific training versus general training. He distinguished between specific and general training by saying that usually specific training benefits the employer who is providing that specific training, but general training increases an employee's productivity across uh, various firms. And this differentiation has important implications for who bears the cost of training. Uh, and this is an important area of research as well. Uh, Becker was also one of the first influential thinkers to talk about health as human capital. He included health improvements as a form of human capital investment and argued that better health increases productivity and earnings and that coupled with uh, overall investments in education uh, leads to better human capital. His work also emphasized on the uh, influence of longevity on investment by discussing how increased lifespan and lower mortality rates influence the returns on investment in human capital. So longer lifespans increase the period over which returns on investments in education can be realized. Uh, so it's a cycle where if you are increasing your investments in education and health, you tend to have make better choices during your lifespan, which increases your uh, lifespans or longevity or life expectancy and uh, increased life expectancy. expectancy can also lead to realization of the investments one has made on health and education and this is also an important contribution by uh, gary becker the impact of information on employment has also been highlighted uh, by becker where he covered how investment is acquiring information about job opportunities and that improves job searches and leads to better productivity this is also like an investment in human capital because it requires resources and also yields returns in the form of better job placements for example uh, for in in these times when many of us are on linkedin for example which is a portal where a uh, uh, where a lot of information is being bombarded on us on a regular basis 
uh, somebody who is uh, who is let us say subscribing to linkedin premium has more information so it entails a cost it's an investment that one makes uh, on uh, these uh, portals to be able to acquire information that can yield returns to them so these are not new ideas these are all ideas that have been articulated in extensive studies by thinkers such as gary becker so becker received a nobel prize in economics in 1992 for his contribution in the domain of microeconomic analysis uh, ranging from human behavior and interaction including non market behavior his work on human capital household economics crime and punishment discrimination and addiction has been widely cited uh, in various studies across the uh, globe uh, the third thinker that i want to emphasize is about jacob minser Uh, who lived between 1922 and 2006 he has done pioneering work on female labor force participation fertility and demographics he has also articulated extensively on investments in human capital on job training family investment in human capital schooling experiences and earnings and so on one of his major contributions has been through the minser earnings function uh, which is uh, one of the most significant contributions by uh, jacob minser and this function basically relates an individual's earnings to their years of education and work experience something very similar to what becker has also worked on and uh, has extensively worked on uh, so minser's earning function demonstrates how education and on job training contribute to wage growth over a person's career and because of all of these empirical studies carried out by economists such as becker and uh, minser and many others in this area a lot of theorization has come up in the field of education economics that we have discussed in the in the last class and in this class human capital and income distribution is another important relationship that minsa explored he showed how differences in education and experience levels among individuals lead to variations in income distribution and this also explains income inequality from an economic perspective because of investments made in human capital on job training minsa has extensively studied uh, this area he has analyzed how work experience and job training contribute to skill development and thus emphasizes that human capital investment continues throughout a worker's career female labor force participation is an important area of study that developing countries across the world are tackling minser's research on labor force participation has been considered ground breaking he examined the economic factors influencing women's decisions to enter and retain in the, remain in the workforce including the impact of education marriage and child bearing on women's employment and earnings Uh, schooling and earnings is another important area by minser where he quantified how additional years of education has positively impacted earnings reinforcing the idea that education is a critical investment in human capital and like uh, schulz and becker minser has also contributed extensively to the understanding of economic growth through the pathways of human capital he has demonstrated how investments in education and training enhance overall economic productivity uh he also focused on life cycle earnings uh, where it was analyzed that how uh, earnings evolve over an individual's life uh, cycle incorporating the effects of education training and experience minser did not win a nobel prize but his work is widely recognized as one of the uh, founding figures in the field of labor economics and human capital theory minser earnings function concept and the economic analysis of education and on job training and female labor force participation have been highly influential and celebrated in the academic community now while i am discussing uh, these uh, three influential thinkers let me also inform the learners that uh, it is not uh, that there have been a lot of criticism of the uh, work that have been carried out by the influential thinkers uh, primarily because of not taking into consideration unpaid work done by uh, women within the households so one of the uh, criticisms leveled against uh, works uh, by becker and uh, schulz and others has been uh, the uh, lack of understanding of the role of uh, Uh, gender or bringing in uh, gender uh, considerations into their models 
This is where I would like to uh, also uh, emphasize on the contribution of feminist economists in the uh, field of human capital formation. Uh, I will uh, name a few notable economists in this area whose work has been extensively cited by scholars all around and I would also encourage the learners to study some of the feminist economists models that are uh, currently in use and are being increasingly studied in the field of human capital theory. Nancy Folbray, for example, her work focuses on the economics of care and non-market work. She has highlighted how traditional economic models often undervalue or ignore unpaid care work predominantly done by women and there is a critical role that such unpaid work have on human capital formation. Claudia Golden is known for her extensive research on history of women in labor force and gender wage gap. She has also been a Nobel Prize winner recently and her work has provided valuable insights into how educational attainment and labor market experiences of women have evolved over time influencing human capital development. Similarly, Heidi Hartman's research often intersects with feminist economics and labor economics, particularly regarding the economic status of women. She has examined the gender division of labor and its implications for human capital accumulation and economic inequality. Barbara Bergman's contributions include analysis of economic impact of discrimination and occupational segregation by gender. She has argued for the importance of considering these factors in understanding human capital development and labor market outcomes. Marianne Ferber has written extensively on gender disparities in education and labor market. She has emphasized the need for gender aware policies to address inequalities in human capital investment and economic opportunities. Shelley Lundberg's work has examined the household decision making processes, particularly how bargaining within households affects investments in education and labor market participation, influencing human capital uh, outcomes for both men and women. So, uh, we uh, will end the class uh, with uh, these uh, contributions by feminist economists. What we have done in today's class is to understand a basic model of human capital investment. We have then seen that uh, most of how we understand uh, the models of human capital investment draws from the influential thinkers, um, the extensive work done by influential thinkers such as uh, Theodore Schulz, Gary Becker uh, and Jacob Mincer and many others. And I have also introduced the learners to some of the um, pioneering works done by feminist economists by uh, bringing in uh, gender considerations into human capital theory uh, where um, an uh, interested learner can investigate more into these studies. Many of these papers are open access today and from wherever you are trying to access uh, these courses or uh, these materials, you will find uh, some of these materials online and it could uh, you know provoke you to think further uh, on human capital theory and empirical studies that you may want to uh, carry out in the context of India and developing countries. For this class I have used uh, two major uh, resources. One is a textbook of modern labor economics theory and public policy. Uh, there are two editions, uh, 11th edition in 2012 and the recent one in 2021 uh, by Ronald Herrenberg, Robert Smith and Kevin Hallock. Uh, I have also extensively referred to the website of the history of economic thought and uh, these are some of the resources that uh, the learners can refer to to dig deeper into the issues that we have studied or learned in this class. So, with this we end today's class, uh, I will see you in the next class. Thank you. Thank you.